Our next presentation is Jonas D'Souza, and Jonas is a technical services manager for Purdue Agribusiness Animal Nutrition, focusing his work on fatty acid nutrition. He received his bachelor's degree in animal science from Santa Catarina State University in 2011. During his master's, he focused his research on the effects of fatty acid supplementation on performance and metabolism of grazing cows and obtained a master's degree in animal nutrition from the University of Sao Paulo in 2014. With a background in lipid metabolism, he expanded on this expertise while at Michigan State University under the guidance of Dr. Adam Locke, where he examined the impact of altering the dietary ratio of fatty acids on the performance and metabolism of dairy cows and received his PhD degree in animal sciences from Michigan State University. So today, Jonas is gonna spend some time talking about manipulating diets and fatty acid strategies um, with changes in milk prices that we're experiencing today. Well, thanks for that introduction, Jackie. Um, hope everyone could log in now. Um, I would like to start thanking the, the organizing committee for inviting me to talk about this topic. Um, I think it's a very timely topic to, to be talking about how can we um, manipulate diets and mainly fatty acid strategies as, as we see this, this suddenly change in milk price. So what are these, these changes I'm talking about is um, these two graphs kind of um, show nicely what's happened in the last uh, year and a half in terms of uh, butter, fat, and protein prices. So most uh, of the, the meal payment system is US, in the U.S. is based on the um, economic of the meal components. And um, as we can see last year, and for several years, we have been having, you know, very good prices for butter fat. Um, last year was another strong year, is indicated here on this green line. Uh, but since September, we start seeing some a little bit of training now on butter fat prices due to production. Um, and so, and, and in this year, you know, the prices were st st still slightly trending down until COVID hit us. And then we're going to see a, a very uh, dramatic reduction in price, um, that, that just happened. So this April month, uh, last week, USDA released prices, um, and we are talking about, uh, butter fat being at a dollar and 32, 33 cents, where a year ago we were talking about $2.50. Cents. So it's, it's, it's a very um, sharp decrease in, in, in the value of butter fat. We're gonna try, I'm gonna try to navigate some of that, how, how perhaps can we um, manipulate in a couple things in our diets and thinking our strategy over, overall to overcome that. Uh, on the other hand, prices for protein um, in the last year and a half have been very strong um, or, or have been increasing. Uh, if we compare, you know, uh, about a year ago where the protein prices start to increasing, the tendency for this year, um, as, as we can see here, um, is, is still having that, that price at least as, as at the same level as last year. Um, so protein should be strong. Uh, where the major drop that probably producers are experiencing right now in their paycheck are driven by drops in butter fat price. At the same time, you know, some of the um, ingredients that we use in diets to drive butter fat, like cotton and palm, uh, they, are, they are higher this year compared to last year. So this is another a uh, factor that we have to consider in our equation here. So some of these commodities are getting uh, higher in price and, and our um, uh, payment for butter fat is reducing. So it's, it's need to us to evaluate some of these strategies. Um, we, we can calculate roughly, and, and this is um, done, uh, you can use um, um, Sesame, that's a software uh, developed uh, by Norm St. Pierre, Ohio State, where you can, um, you know, look to, to prices of different ingredients and calculate the overall um, value or, or the nutrient value to produce a pound of fat, protein, and other solids. So I use these, these values from last week. Right now, 
um, and, and here I'm talking about, you know, basal fat and basal protein. I'm not talking about, you know, driving these through supplementation or, or any type of uh, special um, changes in diet, but the basal fat, basal protein that a cow can produce, um, we can, can estimate today that uh, it costs about 50 cents per pound to produce a pound of butter fat. So with a value of $1.33, we still have a net gain of 83 cents. Uh, the same with protein. Protein costs more to produce than fat generally, um, but um, with the value of $2.48 using the value for April, um, we still are on a, on a positive return for these components. And I'd just like to point out that other solids, it costs about 22 cents to produce a pound of other solids. Um, and, and we are paid about 18 cents today. So this reinforced that although the return of investment for basal milk fat has decreased, um, that is, is still profitable to producing uh, uh, butter fat. It's still prof profitable to produce that basal butter fat. Um, milk, milk protein compared to, you know, two years ago has a good value today and, and good return over investment. So that is a component that we should be targeting today is looking after milk protein. Uh, and overall, producing more volume, as indicated by the other solids here, uh, and not components, has a negative impact in profitability. So although our economics has had reduced, you know, our feeding strategies, uh, looking for components should still um, be maintained, you know, should be still be our goal instead of looking for volume. Um, we one, one thing that we have to understand about fats in general is that fatty acids is really which is important to, to talk about and to focus is understanding that different fatty acids have um, different properties. They are metabolized differently in the body um, and, and they have different effects on metabolism is, is the key. And um, some of these fatty acids will, you know, have a different process through the rumen. They will, they will have different digestibilities. They will affect pause uh, absorption metabolism in a, for, in a different form. So that's what, I will be talking a little bit about and how can we incorporate some of this knowledge when we are formulating diets. Um, I, I've been talking about this basal fat, right, that, that um, we should be focusing and that's still profitable to be producing. So when we think about butter fat, where the fatty acids coming from? So what, what is the, the, the driver for milk fat? So if we can break down the milk fat and look into the milk fatty acids and see where those milk fatty acids are coming from. Uh, basically, we have two main sources of fatty acids that will change milk fat synthesis. So we have the fatty acids that we call de novo fatty acids. So the de novo fatty acids are the ones that are synthesized at the mammary gland from building blocks. Um, and those building blocks are acetate and beta hydroxybutyrate. Uh, and that's generally the cheapest butter fat that, that usually we produce because it's through the rumen fermentation, uh, maintaining good, good rumen health, we can drive those de novo. So de novo fatty acids are very important source of milk fatty acids. Um, the second source is what we call preformed fatty acids. So they are fatty acids that are in the blood circulation um, and they're just uptake from in the memory gland and incorporate in milk fat. Um, those fatty acids, they, they usually have two sources. They either are fatty acids that were absorbed um, as fat in the diet, they were absorbed, they are in circulation, or um, they are fatty acids coming from mobilization. So, of course, that is a stage lactation effect. When you think about fresh cows mobilizing uh, more fat, having more uh, fatty acids circulating, that's usually um, uh, enrich that milk of fresh cows with preformed fatty acids. But how to manage these two classes is, is important. And I will, I will give emphasis, I'll start talking about de novo and then I'll talk about preformed fatty acids. Okay, so in terms of de novo fatty acids, so how the cow produce butter fat, I will talk about three uh, things that we can manipulate in diets and management that can affect uh, de novo fatty acids. So forage quality is one, feed intake, um, that that's for me is very associated with feeding management um, and very technical here, do not screw up the rumen. So everything that we do 
um, that we can hurt the rumen or change some of the rumen fermentation pattern uh, can affect things of the novo fatty acids. And now we'll, I will mention a few things that we have to, to keep our mind and, and keep looking into that. So as we maximize or as we guarantee that we have a good de novo synths of fatty acids, then we can think about how we change or manipulate preformed fatty acids. So definitely we don't want fatty acids, preformed fatty acids coming from bottle reserves, um, but um, specifically in some lactation stage that's going to happen, but uh, we, we have ways to manipulate how much uh, ca the cow will lose um, in terms of body reserves, um, but also in terms of dietary fatty acids, which ones that probably, um, if I decide to supplement, I can get better response in, in what's the interactions with other factors as well. So I start with de novo. Um, uh, as I said, de novo, um, uh, as a precursor for de novo synthesis, we need acetate and beta hydroxybutyrate. So one simple way to drive more de novo synthesis is driving more supply of those uh, precursors. So acetate and beta hydroxybutyrate. Uh, this was shown nicely on this study from Dr. Harvatin a couple of years ago, where he infused different levels of acetate. As we can see um, here, there was a quadratic increase um, uh, on, on milk fat yield and also on milk protein yield. So there was some relationship in this case in terms of rumen function, probably also driven protein. And, and that's an important aspect, you know, maintaining good de novo also will guarantee that that rumen working properly, probably you are maximizing or, or improving that microbial efficiency as well in gain uh, milk protein. There is some reports looking to, to de novo in relationship to milk protein as, as, as factors that are correlated. Um, and, but, but this, of course, was a proof of concept research. So how do we actually do this in practice? And um, we know one, one of the aspects that we have been looking is forage quality. So on this graph here, on these three graphs here, what I'm showing is the relationship. So, so I, I got a big data set that is uh, data about for about for about 1500 cows here and and I look to to some simple relationships here um, between the the total track fiber digestibility and the F digestibility uh, and these classes of milk fatty acid performance mix in de novo uh, it's interesting that um, that is although it's weak there's a lot of noise as you, as you can see here but that is an, a relationship between um, fiber digestibility and those de novo and mixed fatty acids, which probably the mixed here um, are mixed can be partially de novo or performed. We, we assume this is coming from the um, de novo side. Um, so, so driving forage quality or maintaining uh, you know, higher forage quality can help you achieve those um, higher levels of de novo. And, and this is one of the um, aspects that we can monitor and we can change in diets uh, and we can positively impact um, with a lower cost than supplemental fat or other things. So um, this is one way that when we think about the scope on how producing butter fat, we can be helping producing that cheap butter fat. Um, a couple of years ago as well, uh, Dr. Burbano, uh, from Cornell did, did some very nice uh, uh, research looking to um, relationships. So, so he got data from different farms, classified farms, so what he called high de novo and low de novo, and looked to several parameters uh, related to production, management, and, and feed. And, and some uh, caught attention, uh, especially specifically because um, some of these high de novo farms, they were correlated with, uh, you know, lower stock density, uh, higher feed frequency, uh, more bunk space. And when we start to thinking about, okay, why, why this relationship may happen, why, you know, driving de novo or having farms with higher de novo yield can, can be associated with some of these feeding management parameters. So again, looking to our data set, we found something very interesting uh, on our analysis here. Uh, here's what I'm plotting is uh, dry matter intake 
um, um, in the in the uh, bottom here, and um, the concentration of de novo mix it up reform. I'm, I'm plotting concentration here, but um, it's, if I'm plotting you, the, the, the graphs follow the same pattern. Um, which is interesting here is we found a very nice relationship between feed intake and de novo fatty acids. Uh, and that kind of uh, help us to explain some of the, or, or, or to comprehend better some of these, these reports coming from, from Dr. Burbano as well, where probably in farms where we keep a good feeding management, we don't, we have uh, good management of those animals, not overcrowding, uh, we have enough space for those cows eat, probably we are uh, maximizing the potential intake of those cows. And that, you know, certainly potentially drives, you know, the amount of organic matter that's fermented in the room and the amount of these VFAs that are being producing that are, you know, uh, some of them are precursors for de novo synthesis. So that's kind of where some of the explanation between feeding management and, um, and intake they, they came from. So this is another way that we can impact de novo and produce that cheaper butter fat um, without um, without too much cost, but uh, looking more to management uh, um, and, and managing feed intake is is really important. Um, the third aspect that I mentioned is talking about the rooming, right? How we maintain that that really health rumen and rumen function. Um, and when we think about fatty acids, let's consider that um, we. We are not only talking about supplemental fat or fat that I add on the diet, but fat can come from, from forages, from cereal grains, from other source, from every source of ingredient that I have on a diet. When those fatty acids enter the rumen, they usually are in a triglyceride or in a galatolipid form, or they can be in a free fatty acid form. Uh, but especially those triglycerides and galatolipids, they will go through this process of hydrolysis or the glycerol um, is, is, is removed and that glycerol is usually fermented to VFA. Uh, but a lot of these fatty acids that are in the cereal grains, forages, oil seeds, they are unsaturated fatty acids. And those unsaturated fatty acids, they won't undergo through this process that we call biohydrogenation. Basically, the, the bugs will transform these this fatty acids from an unsaturated form to a saturated form, okay? So even though we are feeding a lot of unsaturated fatty acids, because of this room in biohydrogenation, uh, most of the outflow, or most of what's the fatty acids are leaving the room, and usually they are very saturated. Of course, I can have other fatty acids coming from microbial cells, you know, as, as microbial cells grow, you know, uh, bacteria or protozoa, they grow, you know, they have fatty acids mostly in their, their membranes, you know, membranes, phospholipids, for example, that's also a source of fatty acids that flow um, out of the rumen, or I can have, you know, have bypass fats um, or inert fats that will, some will go um, they will they will pass through the rumen um, without being modified by these bugs, and they will flow um, as well. Um, but focus on this biohydrogenation. Why biohydrogenation is important? Well, why why do they the bugs do biohydrogenation at first place? Is because most of the unsaturated fatty acids um, they are toxic to rumen bacteria. Okay, so they can disrupt membrane function. So the bacteria does that as a, as a protection mechanism. Uh, and under a normal biohydrogenation, there is several different pathways, but in a normal biohydrogenation pathway, um, the most common would be you have linoleic acid, that's the predominant fatty acid that we feed and have in a, in a cow diet, uh, will be fully converted to stearic acid through a series of, of uh, steps. But there is special circumstances where um, due to altered rumen fermentation, um, some um, all their fatty acids, you know, can be produced in the rumen. And specifically, some of these trans fatty acids, they are important. Um, why? Because some of these trans fatty acids, they can be absorbed, they can go through circulation, reach the mammary gland, and alter uh, the de novo synthesis. They can negatively impact that synthesis of the cheaper uh, fat that I can produce. Um, so what are the factors that, that you know, make 
this biohydrogenation pathway change from a normal to a to alter is uh, usually there's three control points. You know, when we look to to where we can control those, that formation, mainly one is the excessive unsaturated fatty acid intake. So, um, as more unsaturated fatty acids I have on a diet, uh, that can reach a threshold where we overload the roaming capacity and those trans fatty acids start to accumulate and being produced more frequently. Um, also, uh, you know, changes in terms of roaming environment that leads to uh, reduction in pH, you know, being for a change on the diet or a change in feed management that leads to, you know, slug feeding or, or some other alteration that can cause roaming perturbation, in, in, in especially in pH can accelerate that process and you know associated with that with that ph you know when, when they have too much fermentable carbohydrates that can also be a risk factor so these are three things you know usually we look in the diets um most of the models you know we can monitor uh my my uh carbohydrate levels fermentability today uh and also those rufo but specifically i'm going to talk about rufo and rufo basically is that some of unsaturated fatty acids. So there's a lot of people that look to RUFO, there is a lot of softwares that will present today RUFO values, but uh, my caution is, is, is how we interpret it really that RUFO value. So RUFO is the summation of all my 18 ones, twos and threes that I have on the diet. What I would like to point out is that no, not all the unsaturated fatty acids depress uh, milk fat at the same rate. So, so the potential for these fatty acids to undergo this change in biohydrogenation and cause problems uh, depend on the fatty acids. So just grouping them in a group, um, um, gr grouping them all together and calling, just looking to the roof uh, may be misleading. Also, I would like to point out that if I'm feeding that an unsaturated fatty acid source, but that's coming from, from that that has some type of protection either through the, the natural seed, think about whole cotton or rose or, or beans, you know, whole beans, um, or, you know, some type of calcium salt technology, depending on the fatty acid we're talking about, that adds some protection. What I mean about adding some protection is that that gives time to the bugs work through that fatty acid. So it's not only what fatty acids I'm feeding, but how fast those fatty acids, those unsaturated fatty acids are available in the rooming, okay? And that's also important to monitor. Uh, that is interactions, of course, with other dietary components. As I'm working with diets that are more risky, you know, higher carbohydrates, fast carbohydrates, probably I should be holding more of my roofos. If that's not the case, I can, you know, be a little bit uh, um, um, less cautious of that roof level. So um, that, that, that is some uh, interactions that, that we, we, we have to be looking at. Um, in most of the nutrition models, to my knowledge, they will present roof, but they will not differentiate. You're going to have roof. That's, that's your value. Um, we have doing, have been doing some work in terms of looking how dietary components affect the yield of, of milk fat and, and specific class. So this is some, some work, preliminary work we did. Uh, we are still incorporating data here uh, on some of these analysis. Uh, we published this abstract a couple of years ago. And when I run simple analysis, you know, I, I know that my C18-2, that linoleic acid, that's part of the roof, uh, has a negative effect on de novo and mix it. So based on, on that analysis, we generate these graphs. Uh, we hold constant the other ingredients uh, or the other um, uh, parameters on the model. And we can predict that for every 1% that my C18-2 increases on my diet, uh, that, that generates a drop in about 150 grams per day of butter fat, okay? So my suggestion would be um, C18-2 should be a parameter that we should be looking. Uh, and I think it's even more important than only looking to the roof, is looking to that C18-2 level. What's, what's that C18-2 level uh, is and in, in, in where I am on this diet. So we don't want to be losing de novo and de novo synthesis um, and, and really monitor that C18-2 is one factor. 
The second that's very important is where that C18 chew is coming from, because of course, this is the overall effect. But if I have this C18 chew coming from very fast source, think about corn oil, for example, uh, that, that decrease probably is much uh, rapidly, uh, where if I have a protected source, um, that may not occur. And that's this next example here. So also look into to the database that I had available uh, from some of my stu studies that I did in my PhD. Um, we look to C18-2 here, I'm just plotting C18-2 intake uh, versus milk fat yield. And the increase in C18-2 here across the diet was driven um, by whole cotton seed uh, in the diet. So as we can see, um, this is the opposite relationship from the graph that I showed before. You know, even though C18 chew intake is increasing, milk fat yielding is increasing, milk protein yield is also increasing. So uh, in, in, in a summary, uh, I think monitor roof is very important, but two questions we have to ask, you know, which fatty acids are we increasing? C18 one, two, or three, and, and uh, where those fatty acids are coming from, what's the main source when we are changing on a diet? Is, is, is that rufo potentially fast rufo, slow rufo? Because that definitely will impact um, um, the effect on de novo. In terms of C18-1 versus C18-2, um, we, on our analysis, we, we did see positive effects of C18-1 in milk fat yield. Um, but I think a technology that's becoming, is, is coming to the market and will be coming available more and more uh, is, is some of these um, modifications that you can do genetically in plants and naturally produce higher um, C18-1 versus C18-2 uh, products. And one example is soybean. So um, soybean conventionally is uh, rich in C18-2, but that is available already. Um, uh, this plenish soybeans um, that the C18-1 is the major fatty acid. So when I think about that, um, we have to consider that although both both will have you know similar roof levels, they have very distinct effects. This is a trial done um, at the University of Wisconsin by Dr. Ramentano, where he have a low fat, no control diet, and then either uh, the whole or grounded uh, conventional beans or plenish beans. So the convention being a C18 two source, the plenish being a C18 one. As we can see, regardless if we ground or if it as a whole, uh, butter fat was higher, milk fat yield was higher um, on the cows that have um, um, that C18-1 uh, from plenish beans. Uh, so when we monitor these, um, knowing that, that the fatty acid that we are feeding is important, and I think plenish may become a technology that we're going to see probably more and more, and, and, and um, it's safer to feed than using like a conventional beans. Um, I really believe that uh, when we think about milk fat, we have to, to think, think about ways that we can drive milk fat from multiple sources. So as I mentioned, that is de novo, that is the preformat, that is those 16 carbon fatty acids. And looking to the ways that we can drive you know, all the three sources generally is better than just looking to one or the other. Uh, right now, as I'm saying, um, I think the focus mainly in producing a cheaper butter fat is important, which doesn't mean that we shouldn't be looking to other, um, other ways as well. Um, this is uh, an example where we did a trial infusing emulsifier and changing fatty acid digestibility in cows. And what we saw was as we increased fat yield, that fat yield came from the three sources. And that's probably a better approach to be looking at than just focusing just one class. You know, the DNOVAs are important, but uh, how can we also, you know, look into alternatives to drive some of the other fatty acids as well. Um, we also, when we think kind of doing the introduction, talking a little bit more about supplemental fat and preformed fatty acids, we have to realize that fatty acids in diets, they are much more than calories. So um, I think we are moving on from this era and we talk about fat as a, as a way to, to dance it up, the energy of the diets. 
Um, we are looking much more to the specific effects of individual fatty acids and what those effects are in components, uh, milk production, body condition, and partition of nutrients in general. And when we start doing some of this research, we realize that fatty acid profile of the supplemental flat probably is the first factor that we should be looking at, okay? Um, and when we think about this, the, how, how to supplement fat and which ones we, we should be feeding. Um, basically, we, we, from all the supplements that we have in the market, there's a big variety of different supplements. Uh, we probably can classify most of the supplements in these three buckets here. Calcium salts of palm fatty acid distillates. They are a byproduct of palm oil industry. They are calcium salts. Um, um, they use a calcium salt technology. They um, usually, main fatty acids, they will have palmitic and oleic acid as the two primary fatty acids. Um, we have the mixed fatty acid prios. Those are the saturated prios. They usually um, are composed mainly by palmitic and stearic acid, either coming from tallow or vegetable sources. Um, and we have uh, palmitic acid supplements, or some people like to say palm fat, um, but palmitic acid supplements, they are also from the palm oils. They also buy product from the palm oil industry, uh, fractionated and increasing uh, in concentration. So uh, last year, you know, Jose uh, continued some work that we had started on, on putting together a database from the available literature and doing a meta-analysis on the effects of these different classes um, on production responses. And um, just going over here, this, you know, being a meta-analysis, this is the overall effect um, of, of these different classes here. Okay, so for calcium salts, well, one, just one thing that we did different in this meta-analysis was uh, we limit uh, studies that in, to include up to 3% of dietary um, uh, supplemental fat just to avoid some of these studies that extremely did um, supplemental fat, not a commercial level. Um, I, so when I start looking, uh, you know, what's the overall response? Um, usually, you know, calcium salts, of palm fatty acids, they decrease feed intake, um, they increase the yield of milk, uh, and they also generate increases in the yield of fat and, and, and energy correct milk, okay? Um, so when I plug these numbers um, with, you know, uh, the overall economics today and, and, and a re, you know, a, an average price um, for these supplements, these likely will generate a slightly positive ROI, depending on the, the, you know, the group you're feeding and the condition you're feeding. But if you get this overall response specifically, um, because we usually see a decrease in feed intake as well, that's, that's usually uh, generates a positive ROI. The same economics on the mix set, there's no difference on feed intake, there's increasing milk, but not in the components, you would see a lot of variation on that. Uh, you, today, we're being likely a negative ROI. Um, and, and regarding these palmitic acid supplements, with this average response from these trials that were summarized here, you'll be also in a likely positive ROI. Uh, but uh, remember that, that what we have to look is not only the response in milk and milk components, that's solely on what I'm looking here when I made these comments, but other aspects in terms of health and reproduction also should drive the decision uh, if we should add and which fatty acids should, be, we, should we be adding on these diets, um, even, even um, under these, these tough times. Um, when I mentioned about the fatty acid, um, we, we characterize, I think, well already that cows respond to the fatty acid profile. Uh, of the supplemental fat. This is a study we published a couple of years ago um, where we look to that. And as we can see here, um, as, as we fed four different diets here to these cows, a control with no supplemental fat and the same amount of supplemental fat, but changing the fatty acid profile from a high palmitic. Uh, and then we drop about half of that high palmitic with stearic acid or oleic acid. 
So in terms of milk volume, we didn't see no difference. These are mid lactation cows, no difference in, in, in this, the magnitude of the response. They all increased comparative control, but the magnitude of response was the same. Uh, it was when we correct you know, calculate the energy correct milk, accounting for the change in protein and fat. That's what we see difference across the different profiles, uh, where the supplement containing high palmitic increase uh, energy correct milk by over five pounds, and the other uh, two uh, by about two and a half. So what I like about this study, when I look at this, is when we dry, when, when, when we reduce that palmitic acid of about half on that supplemental fat, we saw about half of the response in terms of energy rect milk, indicating if your major objective is to drive energy rect milk, palmitic acid is, is the key fatty acid to, to achieve that. Uh, on the other hand, again, these are post-peak cows, cows gain weight, um, on positive energy balance, but we did see an interesting uh, effect here that uh, using palmitic in a lake was a way that we increase body weight change, uh, and also we affect plasma insulin. And, and now we'll come back more to this insulin story in a bit when I talk about fresh cows, uh, but this was kind of surprising for us. So that this research indicate to us that depending on my goal, if it's driving more milk, greenish rect milk, or you know keeping condition, probably should be varying the fatty acid profile that I feed to these cows. In terms of palmitic acid, there is a lot of questions these days, right? With, you know, um, these economics of butter fat dropping, is it still feasible be feeding? How much should I be feeding? Um, and I, I went back and, and did this analysis here where we looked to the milk fat response to palmitic acid only mid lactation cows to avoid a confusion be, uh, driven by lactation stage. Um, and, and then we can calculate what we call transfer efficiency. So basically we are giving palmitic acid and we monitor fat yield, right? So we know, okay, if I gave uh, 400 grams uh, of palmitic acid to that cow in a hundred, in an increase uh, fat yield by hundred grams, I have 25% of transfer efficiency. So when we look to uh, some of these studies here, all in mid lactation cows that did that, our transfer efficiency was, was about 23% on those mid lactation cows. But more um, important was looking at the coefficient of variation, even though, you know, most of these studies are coming from the same university, um, it was, was a coefficient of variation of about 30%. So we started to investigate what factors may be affecting this. And one that we realize uh, and we start correcting for is digestibility. Um, so all these trials here, I have digestibility, you know, and I could do the same calculation account for the digestibility. So basically discounting the amount of fatty acids that end up in the feces, right? And, 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 and looking to only the apparent absorbed fatty acids. And here's what I think is very interesting is uh, on average, you know, my transfer efficiency increase, of course, uh, when I discount the feces, but that coefficient of variation really decreased. So I had a, a lower, um, a, you know, a smaller variation when I, when I looked to, um, to absorb the fatty acids than when I looked to the intake of these fatty acids. And that indicates to us that potentially digestibility differences across palmitic acid supplements can account for a large portion of that variation. So when we think about supplementing palmitic acid, we have to realize that not all the palmitic acid supplements are the same. And we have been doing some work to characterize this better. Uh, but um, when we compare different uh, studies here, and we did the meta-analysis last year looking to that as well, uh, we observed that degree of enrichment of that palmitic acid is an important factor. So as we drive, um, you know, a couple of years ago, I heard these um, comment that, you know, if 85% palmitic acid, that's usually the regular supplement is good and 95, 99% must be better, right? Uh, but what usually happens is what we see is as we increase that degree um, of purity on that fatty acid um, supplement, uh, the digestibility of the supplement also drops sharply. And this is a good example um, where 
on the Piantoni study, uh, there was a sharp reduction in digestibility using a 99% supplement. Um, so the degree of enrichment is one of the factors um, and that is other factors that we have been characterizing and this is still working in progress, uh, but uh, the presence of triglyceride or the physical forms of free fatty acid or triglyceride also impact uh, the digestibility of that supplement and also the presence of other unsaturated fatty acids as well. So all these factors become more important for us to realize right now as we try to reduce inefficiency or trying to be more specific on how we approach feeding different supplements to cows. Uh, how this impacting economics? Think about uh, most of the models, we don't have that, but think about that. It's not about how much fatty acids I'm feeding, but what's the target that I want to have cows have available to utilization or how much absorbed fatty acids I want, you know, to account for these differences in digestibility. And let's suppose you, you, your target is 200 grams and you have four different supplements varying digestibility between 50 to 75% roughly here. And all these fatty acids cost the same. And your question is how many grams or how many pounds I need to feed? What's the amount of feeding rate to, for me to achieve that absorbed fatty acid level? And as we can see here, as the digestibility of the supplement uh, reduces, I have to feed more. So my cost uh, per cow per day to deliver the same grams of fatty acids increase, okay? This is a concept that... that uh, we don't talk too much about in fatness and nutrition is digestibility of different products, digestibility of different supplements, how we drive that. Usually we talk about feeding rate. We talk how many grams should they be targeting, but definitely uh, as, as we progress knowing the, the range of these digestibility differences, this is a factor we should be considering. Um, I really think digestibility should be considering in evaluating in a supplement. Uh, I think it's hard to quantify right now because most of the available literature uh, will, um, you know, you have to run this through a cow to have data. We don't have an easy assay like uh, for some protein measurements that we do and, and estimate RUP digestibility, for example. We don't have that for fatty acids. Um, the nutrition models have limitation because most of the nutrition models will assign fixed values of digestibility either for products or fatty acids do not account these differences and and i really think should be a parameter that we should start asking in in discussing more is, is characterizing better this digestibility uh, of different supplements help us to drive nutrition forward um as I mentioned before, you know, I don't think you should be so much thinking about how much I'm feeding, but cows respond to the amount of fatty acids that they have absorbed. And I did this analysis looking to the data set that we have with palmitic acid. As we can see, we, we see a slightly quadratic response. So that is a point that is a lot of variation, of course. Um, there's other factors that will influence that milk fat yield response. But when, when it comes to the apparent absorption of palmitic acid, uh, um, that's, um, that, is, that is a feeding level uh, that, that that response starts to be a diminished response as we feed more. The same for eating carbon fatty acids. This is another data set that, that came from Sweden and we looked to eating carbon fatty acids. And, and that is also, it seems that there is a limit of incorporation in the milk fat. Okay, so in, in today's economy where we, 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 we have a reduced uh, return over investment, I would say keep your feeding levels in the linear side of the curve. So let's not overfeed, let's target moderate levels that um, can generate uh, a positive return. Um, switching gears a little bit, I just want to talk Briefly about pomeric and oleic and how production level may play a role. Um, I think uh, we have done some research looking to uh, what happens if we vary the my pomeric and oleic uh, acid ratio um, on the supplemental fat, but also I change some of the uh, production level of the cow. So we did this trial where we vary from 80-10, 80% 80 pomeric, 10% of oleic to a 60% palmitic, 30% of oleic. 
didn't see no effect on feed intake on these cows. They are roughly the same, you know, there are no differences on feed intake. What's interesting, we see a quadratic increase in body weight change as uh, we drove myra oleic acids. Again, these are cows in positive energy balance. We start trying for cows around 100 days in milk. Um, so this is independent of lactation stage. But what was more interesting was looking to the energy rect milk response. Uh, we did see an interaction between treatment and production level. Uh, so we have, you know, three production levels here, low, medium, and high. Uh, and, as, and what is interesting is as we drove more oleic acid in those low producing cows, we see a reduction in energy rect milk. But as uh, we drove more oleic acid, on those high producing cows, we see in the opposite effect, we see energy correct milk going up. So this indicates to us that probably depending on the production level of your herd, of the group that you're feeding, you should be targeting different fatty acids to maximize your response, okay? So that's one factor that usually we don't take into consideration, but what's the production level of the herd is important. Uh, we repeat this study, uh, with a wider range of milk production in these cows as well, then only look into that 80, 10, and 630 supplements. So here I have milk yield and intersect milk. And virtually we see the same response. Um, those lower producing cows, they respond better to that 80, 10. We see better response with that 80, 10 supplement. For this middle group, it didn't make a difference. It could feed one or the other. And I would say feed whichever is cheaper. And, and as you go uh, higher in milk production, um, your response to the oleic becomes more, more predominant and in, in indicate that, you know, varying that ratio according to the production level is one way that we also have to manipulate uh, the efficiency of this response. How about early lactation cows? Um, you know, there's a lot of questions about if I should be feeding fat to our lactation cows and when I should be feeding fat. Um, that is a common, uh, I would say, um, agreement that, that or, or a common sense that, well, perhaps you should be avoiding feeding fat at early lactation. Some of the early studies indicate depression of feeding intake, no benefits of adding fat. But again, and some of these studies were done very high feeding levels, uh, very different fat supplements that we, or fat sources that we have available today. So we have done a couple of studies with fresh cows looking, looking to their response. And one was with a palmitic acid uh, enriched supplement. And that supplement was fed either on the first three weeks, 24 days of lactation or throughout the first 10 weeks. So in a factorial design of timing. Um, we did not see any difference in feed intake and milk yield in the first three weeks of supplementation. Also, no difference in feed intake at all in the first 10 weeks. Uh, but on that peak period after those three weeks, we did see a nice increase in milk yield as, as we feed palmitic acid to these cows. Um, similar, um, we did see here then in the both periods a very nice response in fat yield and energy correct milk. Okay, so this is, this is about two or two, three times the response that usually we see in a mid-lactation cow. Okay, when we compare with that basal palmitic acid uh, from, from, from most of the studies um, in mid-lactation. Uh, and regardless if we feed or not, uh, at the beginning we did see uh, a response, but partially that increase was driven by changes in body reserves. Cows lose more weight at the beginning of lactation, um, that was partially related with these lower insulin levels as well. You know, palmitic acid seems to um, drive in, uh, nutrients towards the mammary gland, suppress some of the insulin response, and, and specifically uh, driving uh, loss of body weight at the beginning of lactation. That doesn't happen after those three weeks, but on the beginning of lactation, that's, that's a factor to consider. Um, we have done... Uh, follow-up studies on that, thinking about, okay, what happened then if I change my palmitic to oleic acid ratio on that supplemental fat? So in this trial, we did similar to the previous one for fresh cows, uh, where we fed four different diets, 
um, one control and three, you know, fat supplemented diets with a different ratio. So that 80, 10, 80% 80 palmitic, 10% of oleic, we see a very similar response from the previous study with a high palmitic acid supplement. No difference in feed intake, a very nice response in energy correct milk and a little bit more body weight loss. But look at what happened as we drove more oleic acid into that cow. So as we increase oleic to 10 and, and, and to 20 and 30%, removing palmetic acid, we tend to see those cows eating more at their lactation. Uh, by the second week, they're producing the same amount of vanish direct milk, and we did not see that change in, in body weight reserves. Um, so they keep that, they, they, they did not lose more body weight comparative control. So this is probably a better approach when you're thinking about fresh cows. And what I like about this study as well is after those three weeks, we put all cows in the same carryover diet. And as you can see, because we drove that, that inner tract milk higher at the beginning, those cows peak higher. So there was a carryover of that response. So we're strategically feeding supplemental fat and manipulating the lactation curve is still um, an interesting topic and interesting point. Uh, even on this depressed market, we are, we know some sometimes this market will turn. And, and you know, keeping <clears throat> keeping specifically a good nutrition on that that high cows and fresh cows, I think it's important. Uh, this is a follow up study that was repeated, looking to a uh, control versus sixty thirty supplement. And what we observed mostly here was an increase in anisotropic milk, uh, similar to the previous study. You know, over those 10 first week, no uh, big changes in body weight reserves. Why oleic acid is really oleic acid? You know, that's changing that this this metabolism on these cows. So this is a study also done in Michigan State, looking into infusing oleic acid since we these previews were feeding that through a calcium salt. Um, and they saw some really nice response. So they, they fed, they, they, they infused oleic acid here and they saw a lower lipolytic response on the adipose tissue from that those cows. So they took samples of adipose tissue, looking into that, that, that is a lower, uh, that is less like policies happening, which, which uh, agrees with the data on the body weight on the previous study. And also, they look to insulin sensitivity and see that and observe that the adipose tissue of those cows are more sensitive to the action of the insulin because of the oleic acid. So oleic acid is, is an interesting fatty acid to con still consider to be feeding uh, on our lactation. Um, just as a summary here, uh, how we manage milk fat yield these days, I, I think we have to focus on, on two uh, on the, the, the two main points of control, the de novo, how we manage forage quality, feed intake, maintain that room, on, room in health and avoid high levels of fast rufo. Um, in supplemental fat, should we be feeding or not? Uh, my question would be, what are your goals for feeding? Um, you know, uh, if you're only chasing energy direct milk, perhaps uh, looking, looking to a lower level, some of these supplements is, is the way to go. But what type of cows are we feeding, you know, that is cows that benefit more than others as they show up, uh, or lactation cows, for example. Uh, look into the product, what's the profile, what, what's fatty acid feeding, what's the digestibility. Those are questions that we have to know before we manage our feeding program. I think in the next several months, milk fat, uh, um, you know, profitability is reduced, but it's still profitable. Uh, milk protein should be, you know, our goal, uh, looking is very strong compared to last few years. I think, you know, pushing more starch or fermentable starch is one thing we can do in diets. Um, altering that ratio of fatty acids strategically, uh, feeding to certain groups of fat. Um, I think overall, all our nutritional models need the updates regarding uh, the new knowledge on fatty acid. This is an area that we haven't had a good update in several years. Uh, and in terms of palmitic acid, my recommendation would be try to use moderate levels today. Uh, it has less value as the butterfat price drops. Um, and now just to like to acknowledge, I know I'm over time probably as always, but uh, I would just like to thank Dr. Locke, 
uh, from Michigan State uh, for, for your help. And, and, you know, most of this research is done in collaboration. Also, Dr. St. Pierre and Dr. Uh, Hutani that helped, you know, some, some parts of this presentation. And I'll take any questions if I have time. Thank you, Dr. D'Souza. If people have questions, please put them into the chat box and then we can um, make sure that they get answered. Um, I do have a question related to what you said at the end with uh, ration balancing systems don't necessarily account for all of the nuance with fatty acids. So what are some approaches that you take when you're feeding different groups of cows or when you're trying to truly mimic the responses we see in research into programs? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so a couple of things that I look, um, you know, that I have, the nutrition model helps me to look is, um, I, I look to the roof of levels. I look to the C18-2 levels. I look to, to my individual fatty acid levels. Um, then I look back to, to, to the research and I say, okay, uh, what's your target here? How many grams, you know, what's the feeding level here and how can we approach that changing um, changing those those in, in, into a diet. I rarely look anything regarding um, duodenal estimation of digestibility uh, or something like that, um, because I think most of the most of the, the the data there needs updates. So most of the control that I do is done in the intake side. You know, looking how much I'm feeding, where those fatty acids are coming from, what's the source. Um, there's some software really nice you can look, you know, individually, which feed ingredient is contributing to what uh, fatty acids. And, and those are more, more my approach to look into that. Okay, thank you. We have a question that came in. Is fatty acid profile, specifically de novo fatty acid percentage, a good way to measure Sarah or to monitor Sarah, or is it better to switch with, to stick with other methods? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I don't think necessarily they, they could be an indicative of that. I think that is better fatty acids to look into that. Some of, uh, uh, there's some, some nice research looking to what and branch chain fatty acids, uh, as a more, you know, robust markers for that. Um, I, the challenge is the de novo in, you know, you can do uh, mo most of the analysis that have been happen in different labs in the U.S. They will report de novo um, through, through that mid-red um, technology. Uh, that's kind of an NIR, right? Um, and, and they don't have the ability to, to do some of these individual fatty acids precisely. Um, but I think if you're looking to monitor, um, you know, Sarah, um, some of these medium chain, uh, some of these outbreak chain, they are better than the de novos. Okay, and people can still submit questions if you have them. Um, regarding your factors that affect uh, palmitic acid transfer efficiency into milk, digestibility appears to be a really large factor. What do you think are some other factors? Because the CV was still relatively large, even when you accounted for digestibility. Do you have any thoughts on some other factors that would influence transfer efficiency? Sure. Um, I think... Um... So across those different studies, that is different feeding rates, okay? So uh, as I show in a graph that I have, uh, you, you know, the, the absorbed and, and the milk fat yield is a quadratic or tennis for a quadratic relationship. Some of that is feeding rate. So as you go higher levels, your transfer efficiency reduce, okay? So some is that. And another factor that we already are working on that data set is uh, it seems to be days in milk. Um, that I think is related really with the lactation stage. So as you go to, you know, older cows, they become less efficiency, less efficient on that transfer. Um, so that's kind of bring to my point about targeting specific groups of cows. Uh, but those are the two other factors that we should be considering. Okay. And then um, just as a reminder, if you registered for the social hour, you should have gotten an email with login information. Um, if you didn't just, uh, if you wouldn't mind emailing us at virtual dnms at gmail.com and we can give you that information. 
Um, the, I just have one more question about fats. And then if anyone else has questions, please feel free to type them in. For this, you presented a lot of studies. So um, you might have presented it and I missed it. But mm -hmm. for producing cows that were fed different percentages of oleic acid and you had high producing cows that responded, mm -hmm. um, greater energy corrected milk. Did you measure any, uh, did you take blood on those? Did you measure insulin? Did you measure glucose in those? We did. Um, um, and, and it's interesting because um, the response on insulin, it will, it depend on the production level as well. So as we, we fed more late to the low producing cows, we see a linear increase on plasma insulin. And, and I think that's kind of related with the, the nutrient partitioning. So we see less energy milk, those cows gain more weight. As, as we did for the high producing cows, that was a quadratic response. It didn't increase to the same extent. Um, and I think on that metabolic regulation is part of the answer of the oleic acid. So yes, the, the, the oleic acid influence uh, the partition of nutrients probably through some insulin mediated mechanism. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. D'Souza, for your presentation. And if people have questions that they want to follow up with you on, you did list your email earlier. Um, but thank you for your time and thank you everyone for their time today. If you want to join the social hour, please feel free to do so. And um, thank you for all the great presentations today. Thank you.